What is going on guys, welcome back. In this video today, I wanna to show you how impressive the capabilities of GPT-4 together with a code interpreter are and what you can do with it. So let us get right into it. All right, so we're going to explore the ChatGPT code interpreter functionality in this video today. And my goal is to show you a couple of examples and use cases to show you how much more we can do with ChatGPT just because of this one extra feature, the code interpreter. Now, what you need to know is that the code interpreter is only available for ChatGPT plus users. It can only be used with ChatGPT4 or with GPT4, not with GPT3.5. So if you don't have ChatGPT plus, you will not be able to try this yourself, at least yet, but you can still watch this video to see what's possible possible and to get inspired and to get updated. Uh, and if you have this, if you have ChatGPT+, what you need to do is you need to first enable this feature. So you can open up the sidebar, you can go down here to the three dots, you can click on settings and beta, you can click on beta features, and then you need to enable the code interpreter. Once you have done that, you can hover over GPT-4 and you have to select the code interpreter to enable the feature. You can see it's currently in the beta phase, uh, but it already works quite well. And the first thing that you, that you probably notice here is that you get this extra plus here. And this is, as you can read here, for uploading files. And this is already super, super interesting. What we can do now with this code interpreter is we can provide files and we can also get files from it. So we can upload a file and we can tell it to do something with that file and we can also get a file as a result that we can download. But we're going to start first of all here with a simple request with a simple example which is just sorting a list of numbers. So let's say here, here is my list of numbers um, and I'm going to provide just the basic list now. 10, 19, 2, 3, 14, 13, 16, 2, 2, 1, 18, 19, 0, 11. And I'm going to say, sort this list using a bubble, sort algorithm, and return the result to me. And when I send this now, it's not just going to write Python code for me. You can see it's working and it doesn't show me even the code by default, but I can click on it on show work here and you can see what it's actually doing is it's writing Python code. So it says numbers equals whatever, then it writes a bubble sort algorithm, then it sorts the numbers, it returns the sorted numbers, I get the result, but I can also hide the work so that I don't see what is happening behind the scenes. And you can see that the result is just the sorted list using the bubble sort algorithm is this. So this is useful for both programmers and non-programmers because the programmers can actually look at the code, see that it works, also get the result and also get the process. Whereas the non-programmers can just say, this is my task, do it. And they can just end up with a result. Now, this is a very, very simple example. Let's try to do something uh, more complicated. Let's go ahead in PyCharm here, create a new Python file. I'm gonna call this main.py. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna just download stock data because one thing that ChatGPT cannot do and also the code interpreter cannot do is download files from the internet. It cannot send requests, it cannot do uh, any requests. So we're going to just use the Y finance module and you don't have to do this. You can also just download the CSV file from somewhere else. I'm going to do this with Python. Uh, I'm gonna say import Y finance as YF. And if you don't have the module, just pip or pip3 install Y finance. Uh, and I'm just going to say data equals Y finance ticker. Let's go for Microsoft and I'm going to get the history period is going to be one year and I'm going to get all this data and I'm going to put this data into a CSV file. So to CSV, I'm going to say stock or let's call it MSFT stock data dot CSV, for example. Now I can run this. This is executed, I have my stock data here. And now what I can do is I can go to ChatGPT with a code interpreter plugin and I can click on upload file. I can take this Microsoft stock data here and I can say, this is some Microsoft stock data um, over the last year or maybe not some, but this is the Microsoft stock data over the last year. Please visualize it as a candlestick chart. 
using matplotlib. Now, I think, I assume that what it's going to try to do, it's going to try to use some libraries that are not present in the code interpreter because the code interpreter doesn't have access to all the Python packages, of course, also because everyone can upload a Python package and then uh, you're going to, um, if everyone can upload a Python package to pip, and then you can install any package you can just hack into ChatGPT, which is not good. So we don't want to do that. And because of that, it's limited to some libraries. So if it tries to use here, let's see. Yeah, it tries to use MPL finance. I think this is not available. So we're going to run into an error here, but we can fix that. Uh, what you can see here first, though, is it loads this data set into pandas. Um, it reads the pandas data frame and it shows the columns so that it knows what the data set looks like. So what it actually does here is it explores the data set that I provided it with. Um, so you can see here it says MPL finance um, is not available in the current environment. Then it tries to do plotly. Uh, it says it's also not avail available. So what I'm going to do is I say uh, is I'm going to say um, don't use any fancy packages just use core matplotlib and design the candle stick chart manually like this so then it will rely only on matplotlib and it will basically manually create a candlestick chart so we can look at the code here and the code generation is not the impressive thing because of course we were able to generate code already but it also can execute that code and it can also, and this is the interesting thing here, it can do data set exploration. So it doesn't have to rely on your input. What's the problem here now? Um, okay, it, it already fixes the errors itself. This is the good thing. Now, first of all, it can do data set exploration. So it can look at the data and determine itself uh, what it can do with the data or what it should do with the data. And the second thing is it can fix it its own mistakes. So here you can see it gets an attribute error. It says, okay, this is an error. Uh, I get uh, some problem here and it gets another error. It gets another error and it tries to constantly fix this. Now, I'm not sure if it's going to succeed here. If it doesn't succeed here, I can show you an example from yesterday where it did succeed, where I did the exact same thing. I uploaded the stock price. Um, and I told it to manually plot a candlestick chart and it succeeded. Now, again, I don't know if this is going to work this time, uh, but if it doesn't work, I'm going to show you an example from yesterday. So what it does here is, there you go, it actually worked. Now the date doesn't look too good and we could of course uh, adjust this here. So we can say, okay, the date column or, or the, the X axis looks quite messy, please change that. And it would adjust that. But you can see it produced a candlestick chart for a given data set. So I don't even have to look at the code. So someone who is not into coding, what they would have done here. Um, now, the only thing that I did here is I mentioned that I want to use core math, but maybe the non programmer doesn't know how to specify this. But I actually just passed stock data, and I got a candlestick chart. That's basically what I did. Now, Let's go ahead, start a new thread here. And uh, what I want to show you here is I want to create a uh, create an image, for example, some fractal art, and I want to get the image from ChatGPT. So let's go ahead and say, uh, generate a fractal, um, a fractal pattern image using Python and provide me with a download link for the result. And then it tells me something about fractals, about the Mandelbrot uh, set. And uh, yes, I want you to do that. So now it basically does the math to generate this set and this fractal pattern. Uh, it writes the code. And then once all of this is done, once all of this is executed, it's going to save the image into a file and it's going to provide a download link to that file. So you can see here it has some it's it's obviously running on, uh, I think Linux, I don't know if Unix based systems like Mac also have mount. Uh, but yeah, this is first of all, the result. And we can also download the image from this uh, link here. So I can just click on download, and it's going to download the image. This is quite impressive as well. So you can actually see results. And it also again, as I mentioned, fixes its own mistakes. Now, 
one thing that I want to show you here, and I don't know if this is going to work the same way that it did when I tested this, but this is scary. If you remember a couple of um, days ago, or maybe a couple of weeks ago, I uploaded a video on income prediction with Python, where I loaded a data set, and I trained a random forest uh, classifier to classify um, the, the income levels of people. Now, what I can do here is I can actually upload that data set. So I can actually upload the income CSV data set here that we used in the video and I can specify what I want to do. Use this data set or maybe pre process this data set and train a random forest classification model on it uh, to predict people's income. So this is my prompt. Now I don't know if this is going to work as well as it did um, a couple of days ago when I tested this. But this is interesting, because what this does now is basically chat GPT go th uh, goes through the full data science cycle and machine learning cycle. So what it does here is first of all, it loads the data, it displays the data so that it can see, okay, what do we actually have here? And we have certain categorical attributes, we have certain numerical attributes, we have a target attribute, it sees all of this. And it says, what do we need to do? So let's first of all, handle missing values. And it can see here, we have some missing values. It looks like some of them are missing here, it says how it handles the values. It says for the work class occupation columns, we can fill the missing values with the most frequent values since they're categorical variables. For the native country column, we can also fill values with the most frequent category. Then it does that. Um, and it also, what does it do here? It also does already the encoding, it also does um, the label encoding already. Um, now it splits the data into training and testing. Now this is actually not that good, because I had an example where it did it in a better way. Because right now it took categorical attributes, and it did label encoding on them. This is not good, you usually want to do one hot encoding. Uh, but you can see the accuracy is still quite good. I want to show you the example that I did a couple of uh, days ago here, let me just find it. Was it was it this one? Um, oh, actually, here, I only did the pre processing, but it's still it's still quite good. Because uh, this is an example where I did the pre processing, I uploaded the income CSV data set pre process the data set so that that I can use it for a random forest classifier later on, then it explored the data, it handled the missing values. And here it made the right decision, because what it did was, um, it replaced, or it, it identified the categorical variables, and it did one hot encoding on them. And for the income encoding, uh, for, for the income column, it did label encoding, as you can see. So we'll perform one hot encoding on the nominal categorical variables, and label encoding on the target variable. And then it encoded it. And I said, No, just give me the pre processed CSV, because it wanted to split into training and testing. I just said, give me the pre processed data set. And I was able now the session expired here, but I was able to get this pre processed data set as a CSV file as a result. So you can only use it for pre processing, or you can go through the full cycle here, um, with a random forest classifier to actually give you the model and the accuracy and everything like that. Now, maybe I can say here, I'm not sure if this works. Uh, can you save or export the model so that I can use it? And then it probably is going to serialize that. So yeah, it exports this as a job lib. Okay, so now I can download the random forest model. And I can also ask it how to load it and stuff like that. So this is very, very useful. Now the last example that I want to show you here is uh, quite interesting, I can upload an image here. And you can also do the same thing with videos, you can upload a video and tell it to cut out certain pieces, de depending on uh, certain criteria so that it does it with movie pie. But uh, what I want to do here is I have this image of faces. So just a couple of pe uh, people. And I want to say how many faces are present in this image. And I can send this. And this now basically will write Python code to do face recognition or face detection. So you can see here, uh, it shows the image, first of all, this is the image that we passed. 
just uh, a couple of people here. And now what it does is it uses face recognition. Actually, I thought it will use uh, the cascade files. Let's see if this works. Okay, it doesn't know that. So it's going to switch to OpenCV, which is what I thought it would do. Uh, yeah, this is what I thought it will do cascade classifier. So this is now going to apply this methodology, and then we will get an image with the recognized faces. Image race not defined. Okay, so it runs into a couple of mistakes, but it can fix them itself, probably. So let's see. There you go. Okay, this is impressive. You can see it gave me a result. Now we could argue that this is not a face, we could argue that this whole thing is a face and then this one is a face as well. But you can see it recognized those four faces and already plotted a rectangle around them or a square around them and gave me a result. This is super impressive because again, as someone who doesn't code, I didn't have to do anything. So if I don't know how to code, I basically just pa uh, pass the image faces JPEG, how many faces are present? Yes, it made some mistakes, but I don't care about them. At the end of the day, I didn't do anything. And I got this result. This is super impressive. And you can do much, much more with a code interpreter. So that's it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it and hope you learned something. If so, let me know by hitting a like button and leaving a comment in the comment section down below. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and hit the notification bell to not miss a single future video for free. Other than that, thank you much for watching. See you in the next video and bye.